sang before is beautiful, wonderful, beautiful. Turn, if you would, to Luke um, chapter 1. We're looking at verses 67 through 80 today, continuing on with a... Continuing on with this series on the coming of Christ. And I think Eden's going to be up here leading song before long. So we'll see what happens. So, Out of the mouth of babes, the Lord has ordained praise. So, amen. So, I did want to say, I'm going to quote from this book here later on in the sermon. But I, I just, if, if you're interested in a really wonderful, captivating um, discussion of the religious sociology of our day and what's going on, this is the book. It's called Strange Rites, New Religions for a Godless World by Tara Isabella Burton. And if you want to read it, I, again, I, I can't put it down. Basically, you've heard this before. She says that, um, you know, it's, it's that idea that when people stop believing in Jesus, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And that's really what's being articulated here, the, the different things that are going on. I'll quote from it. But one of the things that's just really encouraging from it, and I've known this for a long time, that at any given time in our country or world, I think maybe more in our country and Western civilization, that of the many, many people that say they're Christian, well less than 50% actually believe what the Bible teaches. And again, she just goes through and marks off different surveys of, of things that people believe about or that are really not biblical at all, and yet still 60% of our society says they're Christian. And my very unscientific, uh, unscientific um. A statement is that at any given time of all the people that claim to be Christians, around 10 to 20 percent truly are born again and, and love the Lord. And it's interesting because the other things that she states, there's this big, big, big statement that says we're losing the youth. You know, Christians are losing the youth in our land. Well, people that take the Bible seriously don't. That there's 80 percent retention rate for families that are serious in their walk with the Lord, that attend church, that talk about the Bible, that read the Bible, that pray together as a family, something like 80% of those kids stay in the faith. And so just be encouraged in that. Be encouraged in that. All right. With that said, let's dig into the word here this morning. Again, we're in Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 80. An elderly Christian was in much distress as he lay dying. Oh, pastor, he said, For years I have relied on the promises of God, but now in the hour of death, I can't remember a single one to comfort me. Knowing that Satan was disturbing him, the preacher said, My brother, do you think that God will forget any of his promises? A smile came over the face of the dying believer as he exclaimed joyfully, No, no, he won't. Praise the Lord. Now I can fall asleep in Jesus and trust him to remember them all and bring me safely into heaven. Peace flooded his soul. Short time later, he was ushered by the angels into the light of God's eternal day. Remember that passage from 116, 15 that we talked, mentioned last week. Precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. Uh, when those of us who are born again, who belong to Jesus, uh, we face that inevitable reality of, of heading home to glory. That's something precious in God's sight. And, and the good news for us today, as we'll look at this text here this morning, is that as this little illustration brought forth, we might forget our promises. We might forget the things that we say, the things that we should do or not do, but God does not forget his promises. I've been to, spoke at several funerals through the years, and, and some of those people have absolutely lost their mind, as it were, um, become senile, forgetful, all of that stuff. And, and the passage that I always reference in situations like that is that my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Even if my mind goes, my body goes, God will not go. And that's really, really good news. Friends, our great peace and joy <clears throat> is never about our circumstances. It's never about uh, whether things are good or bad or what's going on in our life. It's always about the character of God. It's always about the promises of God. And friends, that's the thing that we need to remember because um, you might be in a time in your life right now where things are pretty smooth and easy. I mean, I, I feel like I've been that way now for quite a while. We've had a really peaceful several years. I mean, the 2000s were really tough for us. We lost three of our four parents and one baby and, you know, baby in womb. And then, you know, diseases coming and stuff like that. But since about that time, it's been fairly smooth and nice. But, but that doesn't mean that my peace is based on how things have been going over the last five or six or seven years. You know, maybe tomorrow things will turn again and it'll be a a valley, a dark valley. 
But our peace and joy isn't dependent on what's happening to us. Our peace and joy is dependent on the promises and character of God. That's, that's where we find our peace. And that's what this passage is about here. This first chapter of Luke that we've been looking at here over the last several weeks, this is everything about God doing what he said he would do. It's about God keeping promises. It's about God saying, I'm going to save you. Saying it from the very earliest parts of the Bible all the way up through the time of Jesus. And then, of course, manifesting to us, manifesting to us the Savior who is the ultimate promise of God. The ultimate promise. Now, the context here of what we're looking at, you recall that last week we looked at the birth of John the Baptist. And, of course, when the angel announced to John, that, or announced to Zechariah that, that Elizabeth, his wife, would give birth to John, of course, she, was, she had not been able to have children. He sort of scoffingly said, how can this be? And, you know, he, he was cynical. He was not very faithful. And because he wasn't, the, the angel of the Lord said, hey, because you didn't believe me, I'm going to keep your mouth shut. Until the child comes. Well, then the child comes. They name him John. And then John opens his mouth, opens his mouth and declares praise. In verse 64 of chapter 1, it says, Immediately he, or his, Zachariah's mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And as we're looking at verses 67 through 80 today, this is what that blessing is. This is Zechariah speaking out. Uh, the praise of God and who he, who, he, who he is and what he's done. So here's the fact, historically, Mary's song and Zechariah's prophecy that we're looking at here in chapter 1, these are the first words from God that have been spoken to the people of Israel in over 400 years. Again, you're, you're maybe familiar with the timing of the Old Testament and, and how things happen there. Is that, uh, Isaiah's writing some 700 years before Jesus comes. But then Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, is written about 400 years uh, before the time of Christ. And so there's this 400-year period of darkness where the Lord has not been speaking uh, to Israel. And, and so there's this, this emphasis, Lord, are you a God of your word? Are you going to keep your word? Are you going to do what you said? And through the proclamations by the Holy Spirit through Mary and Zechariah, yes, I keep my promises. It's been a time of great darkness, a time of bondage, as it were, under Roman oppression. But as you look at verse 78, he says what? The tender mercy of God, whereby the sunshine shall rise or visit us from on high. Well, this passage here is God saying, I'm here. I'm keeping my promises. I'm the light of the world. That's what's going on. As with Mary, Zechariah declares the greatness of that salvation that is here in the presence of John the Baptist as he leads the way for the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. So let's read together this passage and we'll break it open a little bit. Starting in verse 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his appearance to Israel. So what we want to see from this text here this morning, our big idea is this. As declared by Zechariah, the salvation of Jesus is so great and we should rejoice and live in light of it. So why is the salvation of Jesus so great as we look at this text? Number one, it's a great redemption. It's a great redemption. Look again at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, 
this, this whole, if, if you're familiar with uh, the Latin Vulgate um, or Latin translations or anything like this, perhaps you've, you've heard that this is called the Benedictus. It's, it's Zachariah's Benedictus. And again, it's this, this idea of God speaking about the glory, or I'm sorry, the, the, the idea of Zachariah proclaiming the glory of God. And so we have this word blessed. And, and again, we, we've looked at this several times. There's two words that we find in, in the New Testament, at least two that talk about blessedness. And one of them is makarios, which is what we see in the which is what we see in the, the um, beatitudes, and, and that's a that's a that's a uh, an adjective to describe someone who is in the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. But this one here is this this word eulogizo, which is um, uh, to eulogize. And so what Zechariah is doing here is he's eulogizing. Now, we think of eulogizing that you do it when someone dies and you speak well of them. It doesn't have to be that. You can eulogize someone while they're alive, and that's what he's doing because, of course, God cannot die. So Zechariah is what? He's proclaiming God's greatness. He's saying, this is our great God. And why is he great? Because of who he is and what he has done. We look at words like redemption. In verse 68, and down in 74, we have this word um, deliverance. And again, we sit there and we think about this, and we, we wonder, what was Zechariah thinking about when he wrote these things? So again, we, we acknowledge that this is, this is the Holy Spirit inspiring him to say what he's saying. But th- there might be some thought again that, that Zechariah, when he talks about redemption and he talks about deliverance here, he's thinking about the political situation of the day. He, he's thinking about that, again, it's been 400 years since God has spoken. And, and during this time, think about what's happened to the Israelites and the Jews in this time. Uh, even before the end of the prophecies of the Old Testament, Israel is in bondage. There's the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians. Now we have the Romans who, have, who are there and leading or overseeing or tormenting Israel with, with a very heavy hand. Remember, Pilate orders the death of people, the, people coming to offer sacrifices. He just says, kill them. This happens in an earlier chapter or later in Luke. We learn about this. But, but this is a hard part. Remember, after the birth of Jesus, King Herod hears that, quote, the Messiah or the king of Israel has been born around Bethlehem and he sends his army to kill all the two-year-olds and below in that place. This is a brutal, brutal time. It really is. It's been overrun. Greeks, Ptolemies, a little bit of independence, and now the Romans. And these rulers, again, are wicked despots, Herod being the worst of them. And what we need to understand here, friends, something that we need to remember from this text And apply to our life, no matter how dark things get, be it nationwide, worldwide, be it in your own life, even when you don't hear from God, as it were, he's still working. His promises are still valid. Is God a man that he should lie? Is he a son of man that he should repent? Has he said it and will he not do it? Has he spoken, will it not come true? Friends, your God is a promise-keeping God. He really is. And you can rest in that reality. So, under the inspiration of this Holy Spirit, Zechariah declares redemption and he declares freedom. Well, again, there's some thought that Zechariah is strictly speaking about the political situation, spiritual freedom. Is he speaking about solely the political situation? Or is he talking solely about spiritual redemption? Or is it a combination of both? Now, regardless of what Zechariah was thinking as he was moved here, we, sitting where we are now, with the completed text of Scripture, we know that spiritual freedom comes first, right? And then release from political bondage, as it were. We know that in this life, in this world, in history, there's going to be ebbs and flows of totalitarianism versus freedom. Those things are going to ebb and flow throughout history until Jesus returns. And then what? He'll set up his kingdom. He'll set it up 
so that not only do we have this spiritual freedom, this release from sin and bondage, this, this newness of life with Christ, the world will match the spiritual aspects of what it means. Now, when we think about the, the meaning of redemption and deliverance, again, the political situation in Israel kept the people looking and seeking. They're probably thinking about political deliverance. But, but the issue that we need to be reminding ourselves of cons- constantly is that the redemption that we ultimately need, the deliverance that we ultimately need is from our own sin, our own wickedness, our own depravity, our own rebellion against God, because that's who we are. Apart from saving faith in Christ, apart from being forgiven and renewed by believing in the gospel, we're called enemies. We're, we're children of wrath. And, and it's interesting because you know, you'll hear people and you'll pray for them. Sometimes, sometimes you'll hear about marriages that are collapsing and, and they're breaking down. And, and these people are not believers. And someone, you know, maybe a family member will call you and say, please pray for my, my children. Please pray that their marriage is restored. And, and we want that, right? We want marriages restored. But as believers it's far more important that we're praying for true redemption and deliverance from their sin. That's far more important than a restored marriage. That doesn't, that doesn't mean we shouldn't desire that. It doesn't mean we can't pray for that. But never at the expense of that true redemption, that true deliverance from our own sin. Because, because what, what does the scripture say? That, that, that say that, that young couple, their, their marriage does get restored, but they're outside of Christ. What does Jesus say to that? What does it profit us to gain the whole world? Lose our soul. What does it? And so, so here's the thing, brothers and sisters, friends. We need to remember that no matter what's going on in our life, be it a bad time, a good time, tough stuff, good stuff, we need to never forget that our primary need for redemption is forgiveness of sins and a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Now, if you're born again here today, if that's you, you have that. And that's great. That, 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 that first initial, absolutely essential redemption and deliverance is yours. But Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 2 to remind them of who they were. Never forget who you were. He says this, again, you're familiar with this. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Regardless of our circumstance, be it cultural, political, personal, that need for spiritual redemption, that deliverance is always, always necessary, no matter what else. And and so just a a quick application here from from this declaration from Zechariah about how God has raised up, he has has redeemed us, he's delivered us. Are you someone this morning, not just because it's Christmas, Christmas, Not just because we're remembering the time when Christ came. Are you someone this morning who is constantly rejoicing because of the spiritual redemption and deliverance that you have in Christ? Is that you? Is that something that's on your mind? If that's not you this morning, let me me come before you and, and present to you what deliverance and redemption looks like from God's perspective. God tells us in his words that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, that we're by nature enemies or or rebels from God. We're under his wrath, as we just read, but God sent Christ, specifically in the person of Jesus. God sent Jesus, this baby, to come, what? To live that perfect life, that sinless life that we could never live, to die the death, to bear the wrath of God in our place, that we could never die. And then also to raise again, proving that God accepts, accepts that. So friends, I just want to put before you, Christ died for sins once, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. And if that's, if that's out, if you're outside of that this morning, if that's not something you're believing, please take time and think deeply.
about who you are in relation to God because that's all that really matters. That's all that matters in the grand scheme of things. So number one, what? It's a great redemption. Secondly, it demonstrates God's great character and compassion. Looking again at verses 69 through 73. We mentioned this last week, and I mentioned it already today. I might make you a promise, and being a person who wants to be marked by integrity, who wants to be a person of their word, I'm going to try to keep that, right? But, but there's circumstances that are beyond my control that may impact me so that I can't. Maybe I get sick. Maybe I get stuck in traffic. I don't know. That there might, maybe I'm just forgetful, right? Because that's just who we are. But when it comes to the greatness of the salvation that is available through Christ, this promise is backed up, not by a forgetful, weak person like me and you. It's backed up by the all-powerful, omnipotent God who created the universe and controls all things. It says in verse 68 that he's visited us. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people just, just on the face of it, that word means he comes to inspect, to examine, to see what our problem is, to see our situation. But not only this, he, he comes to fix the problem. He visits and redeems. I'm sure all of you who are homeowners or even rent things, you've had plumbing problems, right? Which are like the worst problems you can possibly have. Really a bummer, you know. But, but what would be like this if you called the plumber and he comes and he goes, oh, here's the problem. Have a good day. Bomb. Gone, right? That'd be a serious bummer, right? You know, you want, the, you want the plumber to come and identify the problem and fix the problem. Well, that's what God does for us. He knows our problem. He knows our circumstances. He knows our situation. He, he knows the, the struggles that we're in. And he has the solution. Redemption. Deliverance. Not only does he have the solution, he has promised to bring the solution from the creation of the world. Look at how many times Zechariah here in this passage references God's past statements about his promise. Again in verse 69. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Several times in that one passage, he references back to what God has done, to what God said he would do. See, when God makes a promise again, he, he completes it. He fulfills it. Now, we see this passage here. He talks about the horn, and he's raised up a horn of salvation. Now, we don't typically think of that too much as a, as a symbol of strength, but in this day, that's what it was. Now, I don't know. How many of you have seen Watusi cattle before? No? Okay, there are these African cows that have absolutely ginormous horns. I mean, the biggest ones you've ever seen. You know, Texas Longhorns, those are little mice compared to these things. They're huge. Look it up, Watusi cattle. They're huge, ginormous, and you see these things, and, and they rightfully impress you. But again, they're usually off behind a fence somewhere. You don't think about them too much. But in this time, in the time of Israel, a horn was a symbol of strength. It really was. And, and it manifested itself in a couple different ways. When uh, an army would go out to battle, they would blow the horn and then go and attack but in a very real sense, the picture that we're to draw from this is to look at a mighty animal with horns. Now, I, I think, now I'm going to, hopefully I won't offend anybody here. I don't know. I think bull riding is the stupidest thing on the face of the earth. I really do. Okay, I, you know, if you like it, more power to you. But I'm just like, you know, football is bad enough as it is, you know, but at least you're not fighting an animal that weighs 10 times and really wants to kill you, really wants to kill you. Yeah, and, and, and I'm like, why do people do that? Because, I mean, bulls scare me. They really do. And they should. They should scare you. They're powerful. They're huge. My stepdad tells a story that he was watching two bulls get into a fight over a, 
over a, a female cow, and, and one bull managed to get his head underneath the body of the other one and lift him and throw him over a 15-foot high fence. It's a symbol of strength is what it is. It's a symbol of strength. When I was in Africa, when I was in 1984 with my dad, and we're out driving in Savo National Park in Kenya, and we come around a corner, and there's a herd of water buffalo. You know, and those guys just don't walk around in, you know, like groups of two or three. It's like 500 of them. And this big old nasty male sitting about 50 feet in front of us, you know, slime coming down his face and all these things, bugs flying all over. And all he had to do was take one step toward us, and we're out of there. We're out of there because they're strong. They're nasty. And so this is the thing. When you mess with the bull, you get the horns, right? And that's the point here. God is strong. He's raising up a powerful, 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 powerful salvation. It's not simply a weak salvation. It's not a little lizard floating around. It's not a little deer. It's a bull. It's a big horn of salvation. And what Zechariah is declaring here is that God's horn, his power, his sounding has been going on throughout history. Throughout history, God has said, I'm sending my salvation. I'm doing this. Briefly, some of God's promises about salvation fulfilled all the way back in the earliest parts of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Of course, this is after the fall. Uh, the, the, the serpent has tempted Adam and Eve, and they've, they've rejected God. They've, they've said, we can be God ourselves. And so God says this to the beast, to the, to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And here's the promise. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. So there you got it. So the head, the symbol of life, thought, direction, will, God's going to crush the head of the enemy. Now, you're going to bruise his heel, implication towards the cross. You're going to hurt him for a while, but you're not going to destroy him. Earliest parts of the Bible, God says, I'm going to save. I'm going to redeem. I'm going to help. Here's the Abrahamic covenant, which, again, I hope you're familiar with. It's really important, I think, in your studies to just go through and do some surveys about the different covenants, the promises of God that we see in the Old Testament. Here's the Abrahamic covenant. It's from Genesis 22. And, and this is what God says to Abraham after he has said he's going to sacrifice Isaac, but then God stops him from doing so. And here's what God says to Abraham. By myself, I have sworn. So this is God promising himself by myself I have sworn declares the Lord because you have done this and have not withheld your son your only son I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is on the seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you've obeyed my voice that word offspring shows up three times, at least in verse 18. I didn't check the other references, but at least in verse 18 where it says, your offspring shall, um, in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That, that offspring is singular. It's not all of Abraham's descendants. It's singular. In the New King James, in the King James, in the NASB, it's your seed, your seed. And of course, we understand what's being said there is that it's Jesus, your offspring, Abraham. From the line of Abraham, from the line of David, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Here's the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, God speaks through Nathan to David. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. I will establish his kingdom. Listen close. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, again, we read that and we think about Solomon. Well, he didn't establish Solomon's kingdom forever. But what? Christ is king of kings and lord of lords, reigning at the right hand of the Father right now. A very famous and well-known Christmas passage here is Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, which is another confirmation of the Davidic covenant. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth 
and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So, so again, we, we see God proclaiming, I'm going to save you. I'm going to do this. And he's been proclaiming it from the very beginning of history. But, but friends, something that we need to grab a hold of here is this, this, this proclamation is still ongoing today. This horn of salvation is still being blown today. It still applies. Here's Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, oh, listen to this. He is able to save to the uttermost. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. You know, no, again, no matter how dark the days, how wicked your personal sin or societal sin may be, what God is still mighty to save. He's still mighty to save. Paul affirms this in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What Zechariah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is conveying is that God made a promise. He made a promise. He's made promises. And he, by his power, by his omnipotence, is able to fulfill them. And that fulfillment is fully seen and experienced in Jesus Christ. This salvation is so great because it declares God's great character and compassion. Thirdly, it equips us for great service. So why do you and I exist? That's the question of the day. It's always the question, right? People have been asking, what's the purpose of existence? And, you know, if, if you're a materialist, it's just purposeless meaninglessness. That's what it is. If you're, you know, you might say, well, I can develop meaning for myself, whatever it might be. Well, here, page 91 from this fascinating book. And you read things like this, and, and I know I've kind of stumbled upon things like this, and, and, and you're like, really? So, it's about you, says the preternaturally chiseled woman with black, platinum blonde hair and tattoos. Your perk, your goals, your drive. This is about you, several more equally lithe athletes echo. What are you looking for? What are you coming, what are you going to come for? What do you need to be? Everybody needs something different, one adds, before the litany starts up again. What drives you? What motivates you? What inspires you? What lights you up? Everybody gets something different out of the experience, at least according to the advertisement, a 2017 two-minute commercial for meditative cycling, Behemoth Soul Cycle. Who's done Soul Cycle in here? I have not yet. Okay. The Find It campaign, dreamed up by the ad agency Laird and Partners, captures the essence of the fitness brand's sacralized promise. SoulCycle isn't just selling an exercise class or a weight loss aid. It's selling the double ideal of purification, one simultaneously characterized by material improvement, you look like Michelle Obama or Lady Gaga, two notable SoulCycle alums, and by spiritual transcendence. You're not just pedaling a bike to lose weight. You're pedaling to become a better person, to become, in the words plastered on the cycling walls, cycling room walls, a renegade, a hero, a warrior. All right, look it up, soulcycle.com or something like that, and go jump in, right? But that's what the world tells us. That's who you are. Be a warrior. Be your own. Do everything. Our world proclaims from all places that individual pleasure, individual Whatever is the end all and be all of existence. You do you. When it comes to personal pleasure and ambition, we are surrounded by a world that says no to nothing. Absolutely nothing. You deserve. You do you. And as I've said before, hell is the ultimate. You do you. Why? Because God will leave you completely alone and you get to do you for all eternity. I don't like that thought too much. I, I, I like the thought of Jesus who began a good work in me, completing it. So it's not me, but Christ in me. Again, I hope and pray that if that's how you're thinking, if this, this whole life is about you do you, whether acknowledged or not, that God shows you the emptiness and the futility of that. Verses 74 and 75 give us an incredibly clear declaration of why we're here and what our purpose is. Take a look. That we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, what? Might serve him without fear. 
in holiness and righteousness before all our days. There you go, friends. There's your purpose right there. What am I to do? I am to be one who's been saved and, and once saved what? I'm delivered from the hand of our enemies that I might serve in holiness and righteousness. There's your purpose. There's why you exist. That's what it's about. Now again, what, can we, what we can again pull from this circumstance or situation that we're looking at in Zechariah's life and Elizabeth's life, and at the time of Israel, joyful service should mark our lives. We are saved from judgment, but we are saved to wonderful, loving service out of thankfulness for who God is and what he's done. Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by what? The mercies of God to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. If you're a believer here today, each one of us should be actively looking for ways to build up the body of Christ. What does that look like for you? Might just be one, might be more. But friends, there's always room to serve. I've been thinking through the months here. What are some areas in our own church that, that would be nice just to see some, some service in? It's not that they're lacking, but here's just some thoughts. Missions outreach. Adopt one of our missionaries. Keep in touch with them. Pray for them. Inform leadership of any needs. Community outreach. Plan and implement ways to reach out and serve the surrounding communities. Database management. We have this database that I use to kind of keep in touch and know what's going on and birthdays and all that stuff. I'm using one-tenth of one percent of that thing. I would love it for someone who says, I love nerdy database things to take that on and really use it well. Maybe our social media presence. Now, is it right for a pastor that hates social media to say, please, someone take on our social media presence? Probably not, but if you want to, more power to you. Increase and maintain our presence on platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. Grounds maintenance and improvement, mowing, trimming, pulling the weeds, considering ways to improve the grounds, shoveling the sidewalks in winter, prayer sheet maintenance. I do that every week. I'm glad to do it. It's no problem for me, but if there's someone that would like to take that on, amen. Sign ministry. Change the sign on a biweekly basis, not a biyearly basis like me. Um, again, several volunteers. Graphic design. Enhancing and improving bulletins and website. Audiovisual ministry. Amen. Amen, Becca. Learn how to operate the AV equipment for Sunday morning, etc. You know, things like that. That's just, just some things I've been thinking about, okay? And that's just not it. There's, there's lots of other things. We, we have teaching opportunities. We have all kinds of different things. But again, the, the, the issue here is, are you someone who is taking the call of God to serve? I've been saved, what? I've been delivered from the hand of my enemies that I might serve without fear in holiness. See, this salvation is so great through the righteousness given to us enables us to do that which we were for do that for which we were created which is to glorify God to serve him in the Westminster Confession the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever that's why you exist and through the coming of Christ we can do that fourthly it provides the great life it provides the great life look at verses 76 through 79 and you, child, in reference to John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, again, there's this, this idea of sunrise he, he's, he's talking about darkness and oppression and, and sin, bondage to sin, bondage to a political, political regime that's, that's oppressive. But he says, look, the sun is coming up. The darkness may last for a night, but the sun is coming. It's coming. And friends, these are all simply expressions. If we sit there, you look at different translations. There's sunrise here. There's the day springing up. There's the day spring. There's the rising sun, the new day, the sunrise from on high, 
or all these different phrases that the translators use to describe this, all of these are simply expressions of saying that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ has life and has it abundantly. He brings ultimate peace. He brings shalom. He brings wholeness and completeness. It is the great life. John 1, 4. In him, Jesus was life, and that life was the light of men. John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus calls himself the bread of life too. Whoever comes to me and drinks this water, eats this bread, will never thirst again, ever. Friends, as good as it gets here, and, and Jesus makes things really sweet. And I've said this before, he even makes our difficulties sweet. He, he takes those things that are really hard and, 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 and makes them beautiful when we cling to him and hold on to him. Everything that we have that we enjoy in this life is from God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shifting shadow. And so our response to that is to say, thank you, Lord, and recognize that this is just a mere taste of what's coming, a taste, a sip, a little nibble. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man what God has prepared for those who love him. John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you have sent. And eternal there isn't just length of time, it's quality. It's quality. As we wrap up here, let's just, just quickly review the promises that Zechariah has declared here. And just, and just ask some questions. Has the light of life filled your life? Has Jesus' light illuminated yours? Do you have knowledge of salvation? Is Christ your mighty horn? Is he the strength of your life? Are you assured of the forgiveness of sins? I just stumbled upon this quote from Charles Spurgeon yesterday. And this, this ministered to me because I, I look back on even my time before, even before I was saved, of course, but even after I'm saved, and I'm like, Lord, oh goodness. I don't even like to think about some of the things that I did and said and those types of things. And Spurgeon says this, there may be some sins of which man cannot speak, but there is no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. Amen? Isn't that good news? You may have things in your life that you're ashamed of. Amen? <laughs> you know, because those things that, that, that show us our need, show us how desperately we are, you may not like to speak about them. You, you maybe even pray that you could forget about them. I do. But there is no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. Have you been delivered from the shadow of death? Are you able and are you serving him without fear? Are your feet treading the way of peace? Are you someone who could say with confidence because of Jesus, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Don't be one whom Jesus speaks to in John 5 where he says this, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Don't be that person. Come to Jesus. Have life. As declared by Zechariah, the salvation of Jesus is so great that we should rejoice, live in light of it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you again for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these bold and clear declarations